seaweed industry is really the place to be. There are lots of enthusiastic people there, but I think the time is to really automize, mechanize, and to collaborate. It's possible with the right equipment to really disrupt. Drying seems to be the bottleneck. So if we solve this, I think it will really revolutionize the, the seaweed industry. You talked about prototypes being ready soon. Well, I think there will be something in the news I'm really a big supporter of using AI and data to uh, reduce the risk, improve the yield, to get the optimal place of seaweed farming, like where to put the farm, when you should seed, what's the value of your biomass, and when do you should do the harvesting. This technology exists now. Does that translate into better quality or more product? Both, better quality and more biomass. What could your next company or project be about? I have a heart for, for Africa. Hello, and welcome to this new episode of Inside Seaweed, where I'm going to be joined by Morten Crosslid. Morten is the CEO of Sirputis, a company providing equipment for seaweed cultivation and processing. He's also the co-founder of Soft Seaweed, a software solution developed to make seaweed farming businesses more sustainable and profitable. Now, please enjoy my chat with Morten Crosslid. Morten. Thank you so much for making the time. It's nice to sit down and talk seaweed with you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about seaweed also. Before we go into, into seaweed, um, I want to, to start with, with you, really. I, I'm, I'm not sure if this is how you would describe yourself, but um, you appear to have earned the title of serial entrepreneur. Was that a goal, an aspiration of yours, or did it sort of creep up on you as you went along? I think it all started when I was a young kid. I did actually fishery farming uh, when I was uh, in the 10, 11, 12 years old mm -hmm. and got really an interest in the business development and creating uh, your own business. And from there, it, yeah, while I was a student, I started my own businesses uh, and further, um, yeah, when I was in the 20s, I had several businesses. So and then you got the bug. Yeah, it's it's addiction to uh, start new companies, uh, create uh, create new businesses. Yeah. What is your um, framework or criteria in deciding to start or invest in a new company? Basically, it's uh, it has to be something really innovative and um, also something with impact. Now, I did create a Windows factory, a house factory, and so on. That was in the early twenties, but at this moment, uh, no, it has to be something with impact make a change, uh, yeah, try to actually create uh, something that can help create a better world even. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I also bumped into seaweed, which uh, really catched me in the way that just, wow, this is a phenomenal uh, product. Uh, the world haven't really discovered it. And I really wanted to see what kind of opportunities is in the, the area. and. Um, discovered yes it's it's really underdeveloped uh, there has to be much more innovation here to to uh, utilize it much more mm. when did you find out about it about seaweed 2016 when a friend of mine came to um, to discuss uh, seaweed opportunity with me i see so i was i was going to ask you have you identified a pattern in how these startups come to life what i mean is are they normally your ideas or is it more like people pitching ideas to you? Do you actively go out looking for new projects to get involved with? So it's a combination of, of both my ideas and uh, uh, friends or uh, entrepreneurs or like uh, founders, inventors who, who come to me. Uh, they either need help for how to actually create a business or how to develop a concept, how to develop a prototype, either it's hardware or software. So, so I found my niche in uh, trying to help them with both finance, uh, concept development, prototyping, uh, building up, being a mentor, being an angel investor, uh, and by that, uh, help them to scale. Uh, so that's uh, yeah my sweet spot there. And um, you know, I've been having several of those into the seaweed industry now. And um, of course, in other tech, prop tech, ed tech, uh, fintech uh, area. Let's dive into the story of one of your 
one of your companies in the seaweed industry then, Sirpotis, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. What is the background behind this venture and how did they start and develop? So it's uh, connected with Metal Production, who is an uh, engineering company. Metal Production? Metal Production, yes. It's mm-hmm. also based in Lithuania. It started to develop uh, equipment for one of the seaweed farmers, which a friend of mine in Norway introduced the ID. And we developed the equipment for this seaweed farm in Norway. And then there was the idea to create a European Union grant project. And to, to run this project, we had to establish a new entity. We invited investor from Norway, and we developed a project called uh, large-scale uh, offshore seaweed farm uh, solutions. Mm-hmm. So the idea was to develop the new innovative production equipment for how, how to manage seaweed farming offshore. So it's, it's basically all equipment, all technologies related, like the hardware solutions, authorizing, mechanizing the seaweed farming for offshore. And, and the seaweed farming at that point was in Norway? Yes, uh, only with the company being based With the yeah. company being based in Lithuania? Correct, yeah. So it's interesting because primary processing or like, like you said, hardware, uh, machinery is not really seen as a very appealing and glamorous area. Like you, you hear a lot about seaweed obviously at the moment, but not so much about this possibly because, yeah, it's maybe not the shiny object. It's more sort of something that happens in the background. What made you take an interest into it? How did you get the idea? We saw how uh, human intense the whole production was, seeding, cultivation, har- harvesting mainly. And we found out yes, it's possible with the right equipment to really disrupt this area or like really, really... Uh, yeah, get down with 90% of the, yeah, reduce the cost by 90%. And then we thought, okay, let's let's do this challenge. We applied for the grants. It was a 3 million euro grant from European Union. Uh, and we got that. So it's total a project of 4 million euro. So now we have put on the, yeah, the right uh, engineers. We have a uh, lot of partners here, universities included. So we have really big, uh, we have this really high, high skilled team working on this challenge. And, and we have uh, all the prototypes or all the equipment more or less developed at this moment because the project started back in 2019. So it's already products have been running for yeah, nearly three years now. Okay. And um, I don't know how much of this you can share at this point in time, but I was going to ask you, what, what are your main products at the moment? So in in the um, EU project, it's uh, yes, it's it's all from hatchery, uh, from the early stage of the value chain to the seeding machine, automized uh, seeding machine, and then uh, very ad, uh, yeah, advanced uh, cultivation system. Here is of course together with a partner called Arctic Seaweed in Norway, who owns the IP, and we have also uh, advanced harvesting machine. Of course, the uh, processing equipment further, like blanching, shopping, milling, packaging, yeah. drying equipment. So it's it's basically all the equipment you need to a new value chain. From the seeding to the primary processing, basically? Yes, and then to, to even to extraction, extraction of different components from the seaweed. So, all right. So uh, starting with the, with the hatchery, yes. Now, that's interesting because you mentioned drying which came up a few times with other guests of the show what made you decide to develop a dryer as opposed to or drying technology as opposed to other technology for stabilizing seaweed it's basically because the, the dryer is is the most costly yeah, stage in the process right a lot of clients needs dried seaweed you can use a lot of other technologies of course but Drying seems to be big, biggest uh, bottleneck in the seaweed industry today to handle out, yes, to stabilize the seaweed. So uh, due to the high energy costs, yes, 90% of the seaweed is water. So obviously it's, yeah. it's high high cost of uh, of drying it down to like 10%. And 
yes, we, we are developing new technologies here also to uh, reduce the cost by also 70, 80 yeah. percent of today's level. So if we solve this, I think this this will really uh, revolutionize the uh, the seaweed industry. Absolutely. Where are the winds? Is it a case of reducing the energy intake? Yes, it's it's the use of uh, energy for uh, how much uh, yeah heat do you need and uh, the the process uh, the equipment of course it's it's uh, under uh, NGA or like. It's uh, IP on this, so I cannot tell you specifically uh, about the technology, but but it's it's um, revolu will revolutionize the the way uh, the drying of seaweed is done. And you feel, in terms of what the market wants, you see dried seaweed as uh, the one where there's more demand. Yes, we we obviously get this feedback from all the seaweed farmers. We speak with most of them in in Europe, also in yeah other continents. All all of them have the the same challenge. Uh, so and it's huge volumes. So um, drying quickly, uh, huge volume quickly, and different types of species is is a challenge. There is technologies that works good in the food uh, or vegetables industry, but drying seaweed because of the um, consistency is is a challenge. So, so especially sugar kelp, which is the most uh, ex explored one or the most used sugar kelp in the industry, it's, it's um, this um, the consistency is, is difficult because it's sticky, so it it becomes a challenge to dry it uh, as other types of uh, of vegetables or. Do you see any other methods for stabilizing seaweed as having the potential to play an important role in the future? For sure, yes. Uh, doing fertilize uh, for uh, doing uh, fermentation, doing uh, freeze dried. There is several uh, technologies. We we are working mainly now, yes, freeze drying and uh, with also uh, also fermentation. But our focus is really drying because it's it's it seems to be uh, what everybody is requesting. Oh, I see. Not that makes sense. But you are exploring with other. Where you are experimenting with other methods yes yes so this, this is probably uh, obvious but um, who are your customers is it individual farmers is it more cooperatives of farmers or big corporations we have focused on the big ones because of um, their ability to uh, pay for the equipment the technology some of it's it's costly it's uh, for taking care of huge volumes. So um, obviously, yes, you need then to work with only the big ones in the beginning. And and uh, the good thing with that is also they have the most experience. They have tested uh, over like 10, 20 years, different solutions. So uh, we quickly get to the results when we speak with uh, the experienced people doing the operations there. They they have the uh, really qualified input on what that, what work, what could what could be done. So our engineers, uh, mechanical engineers, and the industrial designers here, they managed to to move faster than if we would have been working only with small seaweed farmers. So that has been that has been really the um, I would say the success criteria here. Number one to work with uh, bigger corporations with the big players, yeah, and very experienced people. A lot of in innovation sounds like it's something you uh, is very important to you in general. What is your default approach if you feel you have one in bringing innovation to the seaweed industry what i'm really keen to understand is how you successfully link together on one hand the r d element the lab so to speak where you develop innovative technologies with on the other hand the real world of seaweed farming and processing how do you link them together so basically as a it's the understanding of the problem, I would say. Mm. Really understanding the bottlenecks in the industry and see, uh, uh, look at the business case, look at the value proposition. Is the um, the possible solution here or the problem? Is it how, how much is the, is it calculated in money? If we find a solution to this problem, and then to see what could be the cost of development finding uh, such equipment uh, and would the value proposition be attempting for most of the seaweed farmers i mean would, would they would, how much would be the return on investment for them so to really understand uh, would they buy it 
what to what price also. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's a certain uh, element of validation there. Yes, for yes. The, for the idea, how does that work? Is it a case of asking the the farmers directly? Would they buy it? How much would they pay? Yeah, actually, we just one way one way approach is to understand what how much money they spend today on a certain step in the value chain, uh -huh. and then to understand how much you can automate mechanize this uh, process this step. So then, then we have the business case quickly, and yes, if there is of course uh, more seaweed farmers to be involved, then you can test this out, do the first prototyping, and then you scale it. So you first start with a small one, then we scale it to a yeah, bigger capacity. So uh, that's the, that's the normal uh, R and D process we run here, like yeah, without the big investment for the first stage. No, that makes sense. And do um, your partners, in terms of your partners in the academia, universities, other institutions, do they play a big role in that, in the development? Yeah, we work uh, close with uh, some of the institutions like Sintef in Norway, who is uh, one of the, I think, the leader in the, uh, in the Nordics, at least, even northern part of Europe. Huge, uh, great team of seaweed specialists. So, so they are involved in the uh, EU project at the moment, where we develop uh, a better glue substrate for the seaweed farmers. That would be also considerably better than what is existing today in the market. We involve other universities. We even in, in Lithuania, we involve uh, two universities there in the project. So, so I will say the academia is, is uh, vital for our R&D to get access to, uh, to specialists. You talked about prototypes being ready soon or even being uh, in the water already. Is there anything you can share about that? I understand a lot of that will be protected, covered by non-disclosure agreements and, and, and the likes. Anything interesting that you can share? Well, I think there will be something in the news uh, in the beginning of uh, 2023. Yeah. Uh, for sure, it's, it's related to uh, yeah, uh, seeding, um, cultivation and, and uh, harvesting and I believe yes I believe this will be known for most of the seaweed farmers uh, in Europe during the 2023 year. So very much on the farm so technology in support of the farm. Yeah correct and, and and further of course the processing uh, which comes um, and, and there are seaweed farms today who doesn't do any processing uh, they're just sending out uh, the raw material, which is, of course, uh, not that uh, high value. So the idea is here to, to really help seaweed farmers uh, create much more value and, and joining the, the bigger part of the value chain. So you see, you see farmers being involved with the processing as well? Yes, yeah. Uh, and this makes sense because it's, uh, uh, you need to stabilize, first of all, the seaweed. And then there is uh, so many different clients with different uh, needs. So I think uh, there is, it's easier to process it, some of it at the site at a lower cost than transport the uh, yeah, not stabilized. You, you cannot transport the uh, not stabilized seaweed for a for long time. It's degrading. So, so it makes really sense to have smaller mini processing plants around the coastline and then uh, supply it direct to, to, to even local clients. It could be anything. So the, the, the clients range from, from the food industry to uh, cosmetics to you know, medicine to uh, yeah, all different types of clients here. So, um, okay, that is really interesting. So in terms of what you're saying is, in terms of the business model for primary processing and the model that you see is going to work at scale is not so much having these a network of big processing hubs where multiple farms will converge to, but rather a multitude of small dockside units serving the individual farm. Is that right? Yeah, I believe that they will grow up uh, smaller, like, I don't know, uh, corporations or with the establishment of, of those processing uh, plants, small scale processing plants where uh, five to 10 seaweed farmers is, is joining, like find, find a way to, uh, to run it or to, uh, to establish it together. So every seaweed farmer cannot run their own 
processing uh, plant, uh, but if you if they join together, or there is a separate corporation here who who really specializing in making uh, local small uh, dis uh, distributed processing plants around the coastline. That sounds uh, for me like a, a good scenario that will develop in the coming years. I think uh, when there is growing up more and more seaweed farmers uh, in, in by the Norwegian coastline, but also I think in, you will experience this in in UK. The same. In your view, do you see these as mobile units in a sort of like shipping container type or pot like structure? Yeah, we, we have uh, developed something for the like uh, for mobile for transportation either by boat or by trucks. So you can you can ship it around uh, and and uh, put do this in sequences along the coastline like our planet. So it's it's running around the coastline and, and processing, for example, for the different seaweed farmers. That's correct. So the mo mobile version mobile. is 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 really uh, one idea we are like we are really believing in. And so it it would the unit would go to a group of say four or five farmers, serve them, and then move on along the coastline yes. onto another group. Yes, yes. This the same with this the same with seeding and harvesting. I don't think that uh, uh, all the seaweed farms need to have their own equipment for uh, seeding or, or harvesting. Okay. I think, you know, the same with hatchery. It's, of course, now growing uh, up that every seaweed farmers in Norway soon have a hatchery. It seems to be the, the trend, but because of the uh, biology here, mainly, reasons, the risk also involved with the uh, hatchery and the uh, sporophytes. But, but I believe for seeding and uh, harvesting, I think there will be service companies handling this uh, so to, to reduce the cost because it's, it's complicated. And no small seaweed farmers would be able to handle seeding and harvesting uh, without proper equipment. It will just be, it will be too, too costly. So if there was ever a tractor of the sea, so to speak, mm. then you would see this as a shared or even something that the that a service company would own yeah and they would go and and do the harvest for example and do the seeding correct yeah it's it's actually done in uh, just to make a parallel it's done in today in the farming uh, like culture uh, agriculture so uh, one farmer is is uh, taking care of uh, taking in the grains you know, no, but, uh, not everyone is is buying the uh, what you call it the, uh, the the all the equipment. Massive machine. That... Massive machine. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so, so they buy the services to there also, uh, and it's because of the huge, uh, yeah, investment and combined yes, the running cost of such machines. Yeah, and that machine would be sitting would be sitting there unused for a long time, wouldn't it? If if every farmer had one. Yes, so they use it a few days a year, and that's it. then yeah. So so if they now could plan together, like ten, five, ten seaweed farmers can plan it together, all of them would uh, have big savings. Yeah. And uh, have you you know staying for a second on processing? Uh, have you ever considered developing secondary processing equipment? Uh, I'm thinking, you know, extraction. I think you mentioned it earlier, biorefinery, extraction of ingredients, uh, specific yes. chemicals. Is that in the radar? Yeah, we look at that. Uh, and we look at uh, what this equipment, uh, what kind of equipment is in the market today. Basically, yes, from the East, uh, mostly. Something from, from Europe also. But we really want to s develop further in downstream, yeah. And that's uh, where we, I think, the main value is created also uh, in the extraction uh, stage. Uh, here you can take out, you know, so many different components, valuable components, uh, which, um, in, in, yeah, would somebody would just have it as a waste if it wouldn't be extracted. So, uh, believe really, it's it's uh, it's the way to go for the industry. And do you think there's a lot of potential there in terms of added value? Yes, it is. I don't have what to say the final calculations for everything now because the the extraction technologies are of course very costly, and depending on what uh, components you want to take out and which kind of sea, type of seaweed and so on, and which volumes you have. But for sure, the research now done on extraction uh, technologies and so on would for sure 
make sure that there is yeah better tools, better uh, equipment available in the market soon. Okay, I'm gonna switch gear completely and go to a different topic. Go to well, Brent Smith was a guest of the show recently, and he described the ocean as the worst possible place to do farming. Simply because you you can't see your crops, you can't control your soil, it it keeps moving under your feet, and you're pretty much at the whim of the ocean. Do you think data and AI can somewhat alleviate these issues? Yeah, for sure. And uh, completely disagree that uh, ocean is is a dangerous place to grow food. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, and I'm really a big supporter of using AI uh, and data to, to uh, reduce the risk and uh, improve the, uh, the yield, improve the quality of, of your crops in the, in the ocean. That's one of the reasons why I actually was one of the main founders of Soft Seaweed, who is a data-driven platform uh, for seaweed farmers to, to optimize the seaweed, uh, seaweed farming. And the YouTube, we, use that, we use the data here to get the optimal, optimal place of seaweed farming, like where to put the farm. And uh, when you should seed, what's the value of your uh, biomass, uh, and when do you should do the harvesting? So with uh, with uh, the, all the data available, uh, ocean data and weather data, and um, all the different uh, parameters we measure uh, with our sensor, uh, we are able to to actually reduce the risk to to uh, very minimum and to increase the um, crop value or the, the yield during the year. So, so um, this technology exists now, and um, it's, it's like, uh, it's really will revolutionize the, the way offshore farming can be done, because offshore farming is of course more risky, because you have uh, the, the current, the waves, uh, it's bigger distances, so operational costs will grow if you are dependent on going with a boat for uh, for checking out the seaweed farm. But uh, using sensor technology, you can uh, de-risk this uh, totally. So, so uh, soft seaweed was therefore established to uh, really make sure that offshore farming and and yes, uh, seaweed farming in general will succeed much better. So let's take that a step back. Soft seaweed, that's a Obviously, a big project you're involved with at the moment. Uh, when did you start that? Was it very recently? Yeah, that was established uh, just in 2021. And uh, we joined also Catapult Ocean, which is the biggest uh, like uh, accelerator for uh, ocean tech companies. We have been uh, now developing the project, uh, both the sensor and the uh, management system. So we are out now uh, with with projects or with the product to the clients, yes. And so you talked about uh, reducing the risk. I suppose that means reducing the risk before you even put the farm on the water. Yes, you you actually don't need to waste so much time on applications also, because most of the farmers, uh, first of all, is, is where to put your farm. Where is uh, any available uh, land, or uh, sorry, ocean, where you can actually <laughs> get the license uh, license to farm. So that, that's a challenge for most. Uh, with the software, you can identify the areas which are optimal for seaweed farming. That's the idea here now, and we are developing still, but then you get all the application ready for the authorities. Uh, and that's, okay. uh, that can take uh, many months, up to years uh, oh, yeah. in many countries to, to get the license in place. So with, with our software and, and the data available, we reduce this by 90% the time and wow. the money spent on such a license. So obviously, yes, that's the first the first stage, the first decision of a seaweed farm is, is where you should put the farm. Yeah. So how does that work? Would it, would it be the farmer coming to you and soft, soft seaweed uh, providing this as a service? Yeah, it's it's at this moment we do the combination of, of uh, soft with the software and consultancy. Right. Just because we are, are not uh, how to say, able to connect with all the different countries' uh, regulations, but the idea the idea is that we will have access and uh, connections or APIs, what we call it, with regulation solutions, a regulation system, so to uh, to understand where is it eligible to to actually have and see with farm, and then to look at the ocean data, 
to see would this place be optimal for the seaweed to grow. Once the the farm is established and the farmer has got his patch of water and is starting normal operations, you can help them at that point as well, right? Uh, how yeah. how would that work? So uh, the first thing is that yes, soft seaweed will uh, help them to to get the license, uh, or they, and then to to understand how to build a seaweed farm, right? And and basically that's um, yes, as cons- consultancy and uh, access to suppliers of technologies, and then again it depends on the area, the species, the volume they want to grow. And how they they want to yeah where is who is their clients and and uh, yeah what what is their final uh, the idea of their final product so very much a, a consultancy type service and uh, would you provide if I were a farmer uh, wanting to get your support would I need to buy a say a kit of sensors to install on my farm yeah. and 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 a software license. Yes, so so basically, soft seaweed is just the the, um, the license for the platform, the management system, where you have uh-huh. all the uh, yeah, all the modules that uh, you need to run a seaweed farm, and uh, access to the suppliers and access to clients. Yeah, and of course, the starter kit is uh, is the main thing, the sensors that you start with uh, in the beginning to measure, like uh, temperature, light, it could be current, and different parameters. That is. Uh, that is important for the growth of the seaweed. Yeah, we talk a lot about the unit economics in seaweed and mm. the seaweed mm. industry being difficult, and the feasibility and you know, the ability to 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 build a profitable business has been a challenge. How much of an impact do you think this type of technology with soft seaweed could have in making seaweed farming feasible and profitable in the future? So our value proposition is that we reduce uh, the cost by 20%, operational cost by 20% using our sensor and, and wow. uh, the software. We also increase uh, the top line, the, the value and the, the price and volumes by 20%. Huh, okay. So you have a double effect here. The reason is that we managed to, to advise on when you should, you should uh, the seaweed farmer should do the harvesting. When is the, the best timing here related to the, the volume, the biomass, and the quality. Does that translate into better quality product or more product? Yes, uh, both better quality and more more biomass, and uh, without the risk of biofouling. Ah, right. So yeah, 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 yeah. that's the idea here, that we measure the quality, so it's, yes, it will be the, the one that you need, but but yeah, avoiding biofouling. Look, I'm... I'm not sure if this is something uh, that you're happy to talk about. And um, please feel free to stop me if you're if you're not. But I understand that you've spent some time in uh, Ukraine earlier this year. So I wanted to ask you, what was your experience of the war uh, over there, and how it has affected you and the work that you were doing over there with uh, soft seaweed? So yeah, we we the, this is a topic I'm glad to to speak about, and it's it's topic that I think affects all of us, uh, all the world, in in a negative way. Uh, and um, yeah, we we soft seaweed. We are doing the software development in Ukraine, uh, having uh, software developers uh, at the, close to the border of Russia, and uh, we been I've been there uh, during the war time. Of course, it's affected us. We had the challenge, of course, then with uh, I couldn't stay. I, we, I was then evacuated myself. It was not not really uh, safe to stay, uh, even in the West. Mm. Uh, Were you already there when the invasion started? Yeah, I was uh, in Ukraine and doing the soft, uh, working together with the team of software developers, and I myself. Uh, decided then to evacuate on the fifth day of the war. Uh, my colleagues or contractors, they decided to stay because of the men between 18 and 16 years, they are not able to leave the country. So uh, there was uh, lots of difficult decisions in many families uh, when they um, yeah, had the choice, should they evacuate or should they stay? It's, it's made a big impact on me also. Uh, 
of course, I've been working with the evacuation of, of uh, Ukrainians from Ukraine to Poland and further from Poland to Norway and Lithuania mainly. So I was uh, engaged with this kind of uh, humanitarian help uh, in the next uh, two months after the war started. Yeah, so so that's obviously took a lot of my time to do um, yeah, working 24-7 then helping, helping Ukrainians and, and also helping uh, uh, giving the, uh, the aid for the people there. The developers that you were working with uh, over there, they were all Ukrainians? Yeah, all of them are Ukrainians and uh, living, just living close to the border of Russia. Did they have to eventually also abandon uh, their work and their plans? They, they um, put for the first two weeks, there was, a big, of course, big challenges. They evacuated to the western part of Ukraine, a city called Lviv. After the Russians uh, withdraw from their positions uh, in the north of, of Ukraine and in the, the Kharkov region, where Ukrainians, the Ukrainians took over, took back the, the land. So the developers uh, we have, they, they moved back to their uh, cities. Yeah, so, so, but due to the ch- shelling missiles coming in from Russia every day and it's destroying civili- civilians um, and, and, of course, infrastructure, there is now a huge challenge with the electricity, water and the heating system. So it's, it's a question now to to evacuate them from uh, from Ukraine completely. So that's something we, we look at at the moment to to, uh, to take them to, to Norway. So you're obviously still in touch with them and the project is still, as much as possible, yes. still proceeding? Yes, the, pro- the project is still proceeding and in the same pace. So the, the people are there motivated to work. Uh, they, they know that they have to work and they are, the productivity is actually higher today than it was before. I think one of the reasons is that they really want to to show that the war will is not infecting them, uh, like in that way. Of, of so, but of course, obviously, that's interesting. Yeah, they have the challenging days uh, with the electricity and so on. It's good that they use laptops uh, who have battery time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, working on so even the the electricity is taken away for ten hours a day, and they still uh, have the uh, yeah. Fa- battery enough to, to work normally and uh, because of Starlink they have uh, also internet so without, without Starlink it would be, uh, it would be, it would be a challenge yeah. could you just for the audience that might not know about it could you explain what that is so Starlink is a satellite uh, system from Elon Musk who uh, provides uh, access uh, for all Ukrainians uh, uh, for free uh, it's basically that yes, most of them have then internet, well, good speed internet in, in those area where we, there is uh, today lo- lost the mobile connection, so lost uh, internet, yeah, Wi-Fi. What do you feel you've taken home from this experience? What is any learnings or any any sort of lasting impression that you that you've received from this? I think one of the the biggest. Uh, takeaway is that yeah, the Ukrainians are really uh, resilient people. They love their country and they really fighting for the rights to, to be be, uh, be free. Uh-huh. Uh, and um, I think just having that in, in mind and, and seeing how hard they, they fight for their rights, for their free, for a free country, and still being able to, uh, to work full with their existing jobs now with soft seaweed and um, everybody's helping out either each other like there are their family members brothers sisters so it's it's really nice to see how they unite in in the fight uh, against uh, russia and uh, i'm sure that uh, the country will be free very soon and uh, of course then it's also for us for soft seaweed it will be uh, yeah, a great celebration because we, we have the really motivated people there, uh, really uh, doing uh, great jobs. And it's, it's really smart people, uh, smart uh, IT sector. Like it's a huge sector, 350,000 something people in the sector. It's, it's, it's a huge one. It it's makes a big impact on and, and Europe and the US is quite dependent on Ukrainians because of their the volumes. And, and also they are very competitive compared to uh, to what we have here in Nordics.
Is there any actual farming in Ukraine? Uh, no, there was actually no farming. But... It was more uh, software development. Yes, it's only software development. So Ukraine is it's, it's a huge country in this is agriculture. Yeah. They understand the the how to say industry, but they don't need to really be the specialist in the seaweed farming to to uh, help us develop the software. So as long as they get our input, then yeah, they they manage well. Thanks for sharing that. That's really <laughs> it's it's not it's not every day you can talk about this sort of thing, but I'm glad I'm glad we did. I've got another couple of questions if that's okay. Uh-huh. If you think about areas of the seaweed industry that you're excited about for the future or any challenges or frustrations that you that you'd like to overcome, what could your next company or project be about? So uh, yeah, I'm I'm really um, have a heart for Africa. I uh, really would love to see that uh, the seaweed farmers in Africa would uh, be more fair paid uh, for their products and uh, and having access to, to, to more technology that would uh, help them to, to grow. So the idea is here to, to work with the Norwegian Aid to support uh, seaweed farmers in, in the, uh, especially in Tanzania now, Zanzibar, uh, Madag- Madagascar and, and Ghana. Uh, which have uh, yeah you have sargassum but, uh, but other uh, tropical seaweed seaweed species. So that's the 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 next goal. Uh, also for soft seaweed is to like, provide them with an app uh, which can help them to um, to educate them and get access to technologies and access to um, to the market, uh, and then microfinancing solutions because they are of course obviously most of them lack uh, money to to invest. And uh, we know that there, the need is big there. We have been speaking with uh, the local authorities at Zanzibar, among some of them, and, and they are yes, just wel- really welcoming such an initiative. That's really the, the, next, uh, the next project also here, you know, trying to do something in Af- Africa. For, for people in the audience that might be hearing this and think, oh, this, this sounds really cool, and you know, maybe even wanting to get involved, and this might be a dead end. I'll take I'll take the blame for that, oh. if it's <laughs> the case. Uh, is there is there any any particular uh, skill that you'd be looking for for this type of project? Yeah, we actually we're very welcoming any person that have experience in in Africa, not necessarily seaweed, but uh, with uh, some of the seaweed countries in Africa uh, have um, connections with local authorities. Uh, and of course, seaweed specialist who who knows about the seaweed species there and cultivation solutions they do, and and of course processing. Uh, hmm. The idea is uh, is instead of being a raw material producer, uh, like that Africans could uh, could be a uh, final processing final uh, final products and and use them also in in their uh, on their continent yeah. instead of exporting everything to Asia or to Europe. Okay. I've got one last question for you, um, and uh, is one for you as a serial entrepreneur again. Have you had any failed attempt as a serial entrepreneur that turned out to make you or one of your companies better in the long term? Yeah, I had a, a couple of failures as an entrepreneur among uh, this like more than more than twenty companies. So it, a couple of them was a failure, um, and it's of course. It's related to the people you work with, uh, and the, they're both colleagues and uh, clients. Yeah, and that's the bigger lesson in in life. What you have is like, yes, find find really the the people that will build your business and not destroy your business. <laughs> so there is um, a lot of pitfalls you can go in when you're building up your company and make sure that you um, are or the company is not dependent on one person. Or like all decisions made by myself, for example, so that there is um, that the, co- the the business is sustainable uh, without you as a founder. Okay, so you try to make yourself almost unnecessary. Yeah, that's the goal always to to make sure that uh, there are people there who to catch the vision, catch the um, and and manage to run the company without me in the in the lead. And 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 uh, this is one of the the main area of focus now. Uh, so with my lessons and 
let's say failures uh, from uh, before. I think one of the main <laughs> success criteria with uh, running several companies, it's like having really uh, people that is managing 100% uh, independently, like uh, run, run the company without my input, without my interference. Yeah. Fantastic. Before we bring this to a close, do you have any final message for the audience or a call to action, anything at all? Well, it, it would be uh, just that seaweed industry is uh, really the place to be. It's a lot of enthusiastic people there, uh, but I think also now uh, that the time is to really automize and mechanize the industry yeah. uh, and to collaborate. Uh, and uh, really happy to uh, to reach out to all of you there, invite you to uh, a discussion, a collaboration, because it's the only way that we can uh, really make the seaweed industry a bigger success is to collaborate. Hmm. So I'm really open for uh, having uh, you to contact me uh, and, and discuss any type of collaborations on uh, either if it's the software, hardware, or just uh, seaweed farming general in different continents yes brilliant thank you thanks for that uh where would you direct my audience to learn more about what you're doing your ventures uh or to contact you directly is there any platform uh yeah. i'm thinking linkedin or, or anything like that where you would direct them they could contact me on linkedin um that that would be the easiest yeah okay and we'll put links to soft seaweed and support is uh, on the show notes thank you very much appreciate it thank you so much for taking the time this has been brilliant and very very informative thank you it was a pleasure to to, to join